Welcome back, I'm That Chemist, and today we're going to talk about some rookie mistakes that I have made in the lab. So a lot of these mistakes are ones that other people have made before. Some of them are definitely particular to me, but in this video I'm just going to talk about some of the common mistakes that I've made at various levels in my graduate career. Some of them will have stories, some of them will just be quick anecdotes. Also, some of these I was inspired by from Not Voodoo X, as they have a really funny rookie mistake section that I'm definitely going to link in the description of this video. So a lot of issues can happen with glass. And one of the most noteworthy ones was when I cut myself with a glass stir rod. I split open part of um, the skin on the inner part of my hand. And I've seen a lot of people do this. You'll be trying to scrape some stuff off of a beaker or an Erlenmeyer with uh, a glass rod. And the glass rod will snap in half and stab you in the hand. Now you might think, oh, that's so dumb. That's never going to happen to me. And I had thought the same thing until it happened to five other people, and then it finally happened to myself. So no one's no one's uh, above that. I've also cut myself with an NMR tube. Now, I've excluded all the gorier pictures, but uh, I had somewhat recently put an NMR tube lid onto an NMR tube. But for some reason, when I was putting the lid on, it shattered the NMR tube, and the NMR tube went into my hand. And I actually bled quite a lot. Went into one of my fingers... And uh, yeah, I probably should have got stitches for it, but it's more or less healed now. I've also just used a broken NMR tube before. And so sometimes if you break off part of the top of an NMR tube, you might get complacent and think it's probably fine if I just use a broken NMR tube. But if it's got like a big sharp thing pointing out the top, one, it can probably stab you, which isn't great. Two, the NMR uh, might not like deal with the tube the way you expect. So if the length of the tube changes, potentially stuff can go awry. Um, I've also used flasks with a hairline crack, and if you don't know what a hairline crack is, it's like one of those uh, thin cracks that you can just barely see in a flask, and sometimes it can be compromised if you're pulling a vacuum or if you're heating a flask, and so it's better to just dispose of them or get them repaired. I've also several times burned myself with hot glassware. This happened most of the time uh, in my first year of research because, you know, cold glassware looks like hot glassware, but at this point I've kind of learned from my mistakes and I burn myself very, very infrequently. Comment down below if you burn yourself quite a lot in the lab. I've also uh, done chemistry with an NMR tube before, and you can clamp onto an NMR tube with a three-fingered clamp, but they're fairly fragile, and so I've definitely over-tightened a three-fingered clamp onto an NMR tube before and shattered the tube. It's just too thin. I've also cut myself on a slice of glass from a broken column, and when this, when this happened, I was actually being really careful, and I still have a really bad scar on my hand, and if you ever see me in person, I can show you the scar. But essentially, the the nose of the column broke off. It made a very, very thin, sharp uh, blade, essentially. And that slice just like went right into my hand. And I 100% should have got stitches for this one. And I had to um, use Steri strips to keep it shut. And that one leaked for like ages. Not, not a great time. Now, critical analysis. Um, oftentimes, dumb stuff happens in the lab because we don't think through what we're doing. Or we make bad assumptions. And so one more than one time, actually, I've added a solution into an open stopcock in a separatory funnel. And so you just pour the solution in and it pours right out all over the base of the fume hood. And if you're doing stuff with DCM, that means DCM goes over like everywhere. I've also uh, added a solution before to uh, like a round bottom flask. You got everything in there. And then halfway through the workup, right when you're about to start quenching, you realize that, oh, you can't actually fit everything that you need to fit into your round bottom flask without having it overflow. And so then usually the protocol is you transfer it to a bigger container and then you continue it and you try and rinse all of the crude out of the main flask. But that doesn't always work too well and then you always feel dumb when it happens. I've also definitely heated a solvent above its boiling point in a sealed vial. Now I'd say it's fairly standard to do this just by like a couple degrees. So something like DCM at 40 degrees, acetonitrile at 80 degrees, but it's still technically a hazard. But the cases where crap is hit the fan uh, has been when you heat stuff way above its boiling point. And I have a really good story about carbon disulfide. If you are interested in hearing the carbon disulfide molten st sodium story, make sure you comment down below. I've also had it before where I forgot to add a reagent. So I'm TLCing a reaction, all I see is starting material, something like an amide synthesis. And it's just like, oh, why do I still have entirely have like acyl chloride? Um, and amine, what happened? And it's like, oh, well, you just forgot to add in uh, your base. You only had a catalyst. It's like, oh, that's stupid. I've also had it before once when I was an undergrad where I put an NMR tube into our bench top, or not bench top, but like very old school 60 megahertz NMR. And I put the tube in without a collar. And what the collar is, it's, it's like a spinner. And the spinner is able to like get blown by air to move up and down into the NMR. 
And so because I put the tube in without a spinner, the tube just goes all the way in. Fortunately, the tube didn't break. And before I was able to get caught, I quickly assembled this like wire apparatus thing and I was able to pull the NMR tube out with before this lab supervisor saw and I told him afterwards and he's just like, oh, you should have known better. It's like, yes, I should have. I'm so sorry. Um, so that was a that was a happy ending, but like that nah, could have been a lot worse. OK, another story. So this is a story. So in undergrad, we had this big bag of what looked like a sand. Now, I had never looked closely at the sand before. But I did notice that every time I use a column with a sand uh, band on the bottom, so we didn't have glass fruited filters at this point, I would run my solvent through and my first fraction always looked like foggy and gross. And so I always just like threw that out. But then later uh, I realized when I was like refilling the sand bottle that the sand that I was using was not sand. It was recycled glass. Now I don't know why we had a, a ba big bag of recycled glass in there but if you look closely at the like little pieces of recycled glass there's like a green pieces of sand and dark brown pieces of sand that are see-through and uh so that was kind of funny so i told my friend who was still doing research uh at a point when i wasn't about this and he laughed about it and then the next semester when we were doing research together i uh i asked him if he switched out to proper sand and he apparently just totally forgot about it and continued to use recycled glass for an entire summer so that was kind of funny I've also had it before where you're running multiple reactions, you get your syringe or your needle full of stuff ready to go, and instead of putting it in the correct reaction, you put it into the wrong reaction. And I think this is a relatively common mistake. You think, oh, I can manage two reactions. I'm an adult. I can do two things at once, and then you immediately fuck up both of them. Lazy. So there's a lot of times when we screw stuff up because we're lazy. Here you can see this is a nitration going on with a stir rod in it and it's fuming like NO2 gas everywhere and it's unclamped and it's just sitting on a cork ring. This is not great. At least it's on a cork ring, but like it's not good. Bad practice. I've also had it where it didn't clamp rubber tubing before for like a condenser. So the water pressure goes too high, blows off the tubing and then the tubing spraying like a water snake everywhere. It's terrible. I've also had it where I forgot that the density of my organic layer changed. Uh, and so you end up discarding your organic layer unintentionally or you mix it with all of your other aqueous washes because you know maybe you do a wash with like uh, potassium carbonate saturated water or something and then suddenly dcm becomes top layer that kind of thing happens for sure so that's why it's good to always keep your layers separate yes it requires more glassware in the meantime but it makes it easier if you do screw stuff up i've also had it before where uh I added a product solution, so like my product that I just wrote of app dissolved in a bit of DCM or acetone, transfer to a one dram vial, but because the one dram vial is tiny, if I had it on a lab jack or something, just knock it over and spill product everywhere. And then you have to do what we call a bench top extraction. Now bench top extractions are not a technical thing you'll ever see written in papers, but what you do is you get several Kim wipes or some sort of absorbent material, cotton balls. You then get uh, a funnel with a plug in it and you put all of the Kim wipes or the cotton balls in there. And then you extract from the cotton balls or the uh, Kim wipes with a solvent like acetone or something. And then you concentrate that all down. And usually um, you're not lucky and you're, you're going to get a different colored product than you started with. Because most bench tops are not that clean. So another really common one is not checking the inventory. You just assume, oh, we don't have what I need. So you order redundant stuff. This happens all the time in every lab. And it's really easy to save money on budget if you just like check ahead of time. Um, if you're not sure if stuff is in the inventory, you can always like make a better inventory system. And I'd say every lab that I've been in that's been like reputable has had a decent inventory system. So another thing that's happened is I've gone to set up a reaction, add in reagent A, B, C, pretty confident. I know where D is. Find D, empty bottle, or like maybe there isn't enough to finish a reaction. So that can be like really frustrating. So it's always good to assemble your list of reagents that you need before you start a reaction. Make sure you have all of them in the appropriate amounts, then you can get set up. Um, okay, now let's just go through some dumb ones. Here you can see a picture that we're going to be including in an upcoming paper. Um, you can see this is not an appropriate way to uh, weigh a solid out onto weigh paper. Uh, one time I was trying to clean a really nasty, dirty flask using like uh, chlorine. And so I'd made some chlorine, just like uh, something like bleach and HCl. And there's some tar that was just not dissolving in, any, in anything. But I remember that I had a UV laser with me in the lab. It was just like a cheap eBay UV laser. And so I shined the laser on part of the flask and it started fizzing. I'm like, ooh, it's working. Uh, and so I did that a little bit more and a little bit more. And if 
if you touch on the flask where the laser is touching, it was getting hot, like significantly hotter than you'd expect for a cheap less than one milliwatt laser. Laser, and so I shine a little bit more, shine a little bit more. I'm moving it around. Bang! Out goes the stopper into a billion pieces, and then I'm like, "Well, that was really stupid. I'm not ever going to do that again." And so I didn't ever do that again. Um, one time I topped up our base bath by adding in fresh KOH. So just like a bunch, maybe like hundred grams, 200 grams of KOH pellets. We had a really big base bath though. It was 12 liters. It was a very, very wide base bath. And then I topped it up with methanol. And so it was a hot base bath, uh, cause I just added more base and then fresh methanol, but there must've been some impurity in it. So some organic compound, because after I added the methanol, it, it just suddenly went foomph and a giant blue wall came out from the base bath i'm like oh crap so i quickly put the lid on and put it out and i just like could feel the top of it like the heat of the flame in there before it got quenched got the lid even hot and so always dissolve your your base slowly you know do what you oughta add acid to water add your base to your water after get everything dissolved first and you don't want to get a ton of exotherm follow a good established protocol for preparing base baths and if there's impurities in your base bath, make sure you prepare a fresh one. Another time, this has happened several times, uh, trying to flush out silica gel with solvent, eluent, so that you can get all the junk off of it before you discard of the silica. And you put like a keck clip, which is just like a plastic clip on the on the joint. And then the pressure gets too high, ruptures, the sometimes it destroys the plastic keck clip and then it sends the glass adapter flying and it usually breaks on the back of the fume hood or the base of the fume hood um, or sometimes it comes down and breaks the column as well it's like not a not a pleasant thing to have happen definitely can happen so it's always good to have a pressure relief system in place for uh purging or flushing a column so that that does not happen um a really, really common one is overfilling a waste jug. You can't quite see where the line is. Maybe it's like dark in your fume hood. You add too much and then it overflows. And then you have to pour out the very full waste jug into another waste jug, which isn't convenient. Or you let it evaporate, which isn't great either. Because then you're putting off whatever toxic chemicals are in there into the environment. So that has happened so many times that like everyone's experienced this. I, I'm pretty sure if you haven't experienced overflowing a waste jug, make sure you comment down below. So then there's things that come from just lack of experience. Maybe you don't know there's a certain way to do things. Maybe you forget to put lids back on containers. That kind of thing happens. And so one of the things that happens is when you're collecting fractions, when you're running column, you forget to top up the solvent. And so if you don't top up the solvent, the silica can run dry and then the column cracks. Then your separation essentially gets ruined because then stuff just flows through the cracks instead of flowing through the silica gel, which is nicely packed. Additionally, if you're collecting fractions via cro in chromatography, sometimes you don't switch out your test tube, then your test tube overflows, then you lose product, and maybe it was right when your product started coming off, and that's just not a pleasant experience. So it's always good if someone's easily distracted when they're running a column, don't distract them, talk to them about the interesting thing after, otherwise they're going to be a little bit pissed off that like you interrupted them and then they dinked up their column. Um, another thing that a lot of us will have experienced is you still have the stopper in your SEP funnel, you try and drain it, and then suddenly the liquid flow like just doesn't work. And so maybe if you're like letting it flow while you're doing this, you'll try and unstopper it. But then when you unstopper it, all of it flushes down at once because the flow rate is really high. So always close your stopcock before modifying the uh, before modifying the stopper. Okay, another thing that's common, which you may not be familiar with, is if you're running a column and you're doing a gradient dilution from one polarity to another, you need to gradually change the polarity. So if you want to go from 100% hexane to 50% ethyl acetate, you do not just slam in 50% ethyl acetate, especially for that um, that significant of a transition, because it'll just crack the silica gel because there'll be a massive exotherm all of a sudden from a change in polarity. And so that that's quite common. It's even worse with like pentane, but hexane definitely happens. Um, now, when I started doing undergrad research, we were tasked with cleaning out this fume hood, which is just full of people's old reaction vials, tons of junk, and we were taught about mole sieves that day. Oh, mole sieves, that, those are the little things in the vials. You can just put all the mole sieves in the mole sieve waste. Um, okay, so we did that. So we dumped out, like, hundreds of vials, and we definitely threw out at least 20 rectangular mole sieves, which were white. We're like, oh, that's neat. They have different colors of mole sieves. I didn't know that. And uh, a couple years later, someone was telling me about flea bars. And I'm like, oh, what's a flea bar? I've never heard of a flea bar before. They're like, oh, it's so you can run reactions in vials. You know, it's nice and small, or you can run it in a schlank flask. So it's like, oh, cool. And so they show it, show me what a flea bar looks like. And I immediately realize two years earlier, 
I had definitely thrown out like 20 flea bars with my friend when we were cleaning stuff. So that's not great. Um, additionally, one time I made 10 grams of tosylazide thinking, oh, it's just like a chemical. You know, I'm going to do several reactions with this. This is fine. This is like an okay thing to do. But I didn't realize quite how dangerous tosylazide was at this point in time. If you look on my old channel, I actually have a video of me quenching the remainder of this 10 grams of tosylazide. Um, it's kind of a long video, not too interesting, but that's there if you want to see it. So hopefully this has been an entertaining video about rookie mistakes in the lab and things not to do, and hopefully it was a little bit informative. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. It would really help out the channel if you left a like and subscribed. I hope you have a great day.